Thank you. Thank you, John, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure for me to join John to welcome you and the Heritage Foundation to welcome you to this, the Joseph Story Distinguished Lecture. Uh, this is one of Heritage's most uh, prestigious events of the year, and we are very happy to sponsor it this evening, particularly because of the guest that I'll introduce in a moment. Uh, the Joseph Story Lecture has traditionally been held in conjunction with two other important events of our Center for Legal and Judicial Studies. One is the Legal Strategy Forum, and so in the audience tonight, we have uh, nearly 50 CEOs and chief legal officers from the freedom-based public interest law firms of this nation, and we're happy to have them with us, particularly on this occasion. The other event is uh, a series that we started some years ago called the Preserve the Constitution series, and so this is one of several of these type of events in which various aspects and issues of the Constitution and the rule of law are discussed by various experts. And we're, uh, then, so that this uh, Joseph Story uh, lecture really fits right in to that pattern where we discuss the importance of constitutional fidelity and the rule of law. <coughs> of course, this lecture has been named in honor of one of our country's foremost judicial and legal scholars, a man who distinguished himself in so many different ways. Uh, Joseph Story was involved in politics and civic activities in his native state of Massachusetts. Uh, he was a scholar. He taught even while a justice of the Supreme Court at the Harvard Law School and was a member of that faculty, uh, starting uh, what I suspect was a pattern that has been imitated by many justices since that time, including our guests this evening. He held various offices in his home uh, town and, and that area, and also served in the House of Representatives, representing uh, his district in Massachusetts. He was appointed to the United States Supreme Court by James Madison in 1812, and he served until 1845, uh, when he passed away at the age of 65. But what makes him particularly noted, as far as we are concerned, was his commitment to the Constitution of the United States as it was written. He was a true defender of that document, our foremost charter, and believed that being faithful to the text of the Constitution and what it, how it was understood to mean by those who wrote it and ratified it, as well as the amendments in subsequent years, was the only way in which a judge or justice could legitimately interpret that document as they would any other legal document. And so it was that commitment to the Constitution that led him to write one of the foremost commentaries on the Constitution of any author in the history of the country. And it was indeed stories, commentaries that are still used to understand the way in which it should be interpreted by the legal profession and by uh, the judges and, of course, the members of the Supreme Court. It's appropriate, then, that the story lecture feature tonight our particular guest. Clarence Thomas is a unique individual also, like just a story. And that is, uh, for one thing, he served in all three branches of our federal government. He worked in the, in the uh, Senate office of Senator Jack Danforth from Missouri. He worked in the Reagan administration in two capacities. He was chairman of, he was uh, first assistant secretary of education for civil rights, and then he was chairman of the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. And then, of course, he was appointed uh, initially by uh, George H.W. Bush as a judge of the United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit and then ultimately as a, an Associate Justice of the United States Supreme Court in 1991. We mentioned, and we were discussing this uh, before we came in tonight, that last Sunday was his 25th anniversary as a member of the court. I could not introduce Clarence without also mentioning his lovely wife, Jenny, who is with us tonight. She has been a, a great helpmate of hers, as I'm, he would be the, I'm sure he would be the first to, to tell you. She herself has a distinguished career in this city and in our country, uh, both in civic activities, in think tanks, as well as in TV. And so we're pleased to have you with us also, Jenny. <laughs> Uh, 
When I say that it's very appropriate that Clarence Thomas be our Joseph Story lecture tonight, it's because of his lifelong and particularly judicial period of dedication to the Constitution of the United States. He is, in my mind, one of the clearest writers that we've ever had on the U.S. Supreme Court, and his clear writing has made it clear, if you will, that, that, that the Constitution, as written, should be interpreted according to those who, as I mentioned, wrote it and ratified it. And that has been an important part of preserving the thoughts and ideas that Ronald Reagan had when he first appointed him uh, to a branch, a position in the executive branch, and what uh, 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 President Bush had in mind when he appointed him to two, ju to two judicial positions. And that is the fact that we need judges who will be faithful to the rule of law and to the Constitution itself if we're going to preserve self-government and liberty for the people of this country. At no time in our history, in my opinion, has this been more important as a concept and more important as something to be defended than it is at the present time. And so that is why we are so honored to have him as our guest tonight. Uh, Randy Barnett, who I see in here tonight, a uh, constitutional law professor at Georgetown University Law Center, uh, called Judge, just then Judge and now Justice Thomas, a fearless originalist. He honors the Constitution as it was written. And he went on to say, he elevates the original meaning of the text above precedent. In other words, he puts the founders above dead justices. <laughs> I, I might add, he puts them above live justices as well. <laughs> I think the best test of anyone appointed to the, any court is how the person who appointed him feels about him. And that's why I think we should all be interested to know that President Bush, in talking about him, said this about him and how proud he was of this selection. He said, while Justice Thomas is known both for his consistently sober demeanor on the bench and his thoughtful and respected jurisprudence, he is also widely admired for his warmth among his colleagues, law clerks, and the court staff. He wound up by saying he is a very good man, and that's why I'm so pleased to introduce to you tonight uh, that good man, Clarence Thomas. <laughs> Joining him tonight in this discussion is the director of the Center for Legal and Judicial Studies, John Malcolm, who has a distinguished career himself in law, in government, and now as the director of this center here at the Heritage Foundation. John, I'll turn it over to you. Please welcome John Malcolm. Thank you. Justice Thomas, it's a, um, it's a real pleasure and a privilege to be here on the stage with you. Uh, congratulations on, uh, on being on the court for 25 years. I'd like to begin our conversation with perhaps some reflections on those 25 years. What, what surprised you the most uh, about your time, your time on the court? Well, first of all, let me, uh, John, thank Can you all hear me? Yeah, yeah cuz I have trouble hearing myself, but <laughs> the, um, the, I'd like to thank uh, uh, General Meese for the introduction. Uh, and I think I've grown up. Uh, I met General Meese in December 1980, and I consider it a distinct honor to have served with you in the Reagan administration and to have known you now for over 35 years. Um, and that just, uh, holds true also for Ursula. Uh, I just think that um, I love, I remember when you were being um, criticized heavily, and that's an understatement in the city. Your demeanor, your pleasant demeanor never changed. Uh, your positive attitude, your willingness to talk to young people and to persuade them to your ideas, but not returning it with uh, fire with fire. Uh, that is, has much to commend itself and much to admire. So thank you, Ed, not only for the years together, but for your example. Um, <laughs> The, um, I 
first of all, and I also like to thank Heritage, Ed Fulner, and all the uh, and Senator Dement, all who were involved with this evening. Um, the I, of course, my wife and I have made lots of trips here <laughs> when she was working here, and we just love being around her. So, come over here and see her. So, but um, you know, I don't spend a lot of time thinking back over over the time. We're too busy doing our work. Um, I'm not a navel gazer. I mean, that's just a, <laughs> we've got enough navel gazers in the society. Um, we have. Um, you know, I think over the last few years, uh, some things have happened at the court, uh, certainly last year, that changed the way that we work. And uh, we have to be focused on that. Now, maybe this will, there were things you were thinking of talking about, but if I reflect back on the years, the thing that I enjoy most are my law clerks. Love my law clerks. Um, the, they make it fun, they make, it's the energy. I mean, the, the first year was really tough. I don't know how we survived that. But, at, um, and then, but I see those clerks today, and the affection you have for them is just tremendous because they were there at the beginning when we didn't have systems, we didn't have computers, when we had four cases a day. Um, but through the years, um, I, I think I have, to, I have to say the consistency the effort to have a consistent uh, judicial philosophy and when you can't try to explain why you've changed, I think you owe that to people. Try to have, try to make the work the uh, understandable, to make it uh, make sense. Uh, and when it doesn't make sense, to try to point out why you think it doesn't make sense, say something like the dormant commerce clause. So it's sort of like a hibernating bear or something. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and it just says, if you can't explain it, you know, you should at least tell people why you can. <laughs> and if, if it doesn't make sense, I think, you, as my granddaddy used to say, boy, it don't make sense because it don't make sense. <laughs> and, <laughs> and um, but you know, we try to, uh, to make it accessible. You know, one of the fun times for me, I think, there are things that are not, you know, in this city, people are, they think they really enjoy each other, enjoy themselves, I don't know. But, uh, <laughs> I was, we were on one of our road trips with my law clerks, and this gentleman comes up to me, and he's, boy, he's excited, he runs up, we were at Gettysburg, and he runs up Little Round Top, you know, and he's really perspiring, it's like, June, you know. It's not a Civil War reenactor. Oh, no. He's just a guy. <laughs> and he's running and he runs me down, you know. He has this um, fake parchment paper with an opinion on it. I need you to sign this. I'm glad I caught up with you. I said, Whoa, what is this? He said, It's your Federal Maritime Commission opinion. <laughs> I said, Well, why are you here with that? He said, that's what this is all about. <laughs> but he said, I want to thank you because I could understand what you were saying. And he said, I read all your opinions because I can understand them. I think we are obligated to make the Constitution and what we write about the Constitution accessible to our fellow citizens. So I assume that that empowers people by giving them a sense that the Constitution is really theirs and ought to be accessible. Well, it is theirs, and I think we hide it from them uh, when we write in language that's inaccessible. I mean, if you think about it, I had a buddy of mine who was a wonderful, wonderful friend who was quadriplegic. And I remember before you had curb cuts, a curb that high, two or three inches high, was like the Great Wall of China. Right. I mean, he was, he was the, the, that part of the city or building was inaccessible to him. And I think sometimes we make something that should be accessible. Today, of course, we have made the, the curbs flush with the street, so it's accessible. Well, we can kind of do that with language, too. I, one of the things I tell my law clerks is that genius is not 
putting a uh, $2 idea in a $20 sentence. It's putting a $20 idea in a $2 sentence uh, without any loss of meaning, and, but that takes work. And it takes organization and editing, et cetera. But I think the citizens, we owe it to people to present to them their constitution in a way they can understand to enfranchise them constitutionally. So you mentioned that, it, the, that you take your clerks to, to Gettysburg, and I was curious about that. Why, why do you do that, and what are some of the experiences or reactions you've gotten from them when you've done that? They're polite. <laughs> 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 it's actually, I was going to stop doing it, and um, there was some resistance to discontinuing the trip. Uh, I really enjoy it. Uh, and I read Battle Cry, I think, to understand the 14th Amendment in particular and the post-Civil War era, you have to understand the Civil War first. And we ha you have to understand our history. That started, actually, when I was at EEOC. I wanted to understand the founding better, and I hired a couple of guys, young men from um, Claremont, uh, John Marini and Ken Masugi. And I wasn't planning on being a judge. I just wanted to understand our founding. And as a part of that, you read Civil War history, you read the, the Lincoln-Douglas debates, all sorts of things. And I thought it would be important for my clerks to go, not just talk about the 14th Amendment, not just talk about the Equal Protection Clause, not just talk about substantive due process, but to go and feel it, to see the place, to see why, what was this about, why did people die, to go where Lincoln delivered the Gettysburg Address, you know, where he sort of implores us to, to the living, to make it worthwhile, There's this experiment, the, the, these people who'd given the last full measure. And also, it's the end of the term. And at the end of the term, you can be a little bit upset. Um, <laughs> and, and people can become, the, these kids can see how the sausage is made and become a little bit cynical or a little bit jaded. And I always thought it was a great idea to go and to have them see it wasn't about winning an argument. It wasn't about a subject. It wasn't about just this little thing. It's about us. It's about our country. And to encourage them to remain hopeful despite what they have seen, to remain idealists despite what they have seen and what has happened. Because in these jobs, a lot of negativity comes in. But you've got to, I mean, that's a lesson, I, again, as I mentioned, I learned from General Meese, that you somehow, you keep it together and you present the, you say, look, I know I'm experienced, I've seen how the sausage is made, but this ideal, that's all we have left is this wonderful ideal of, of what the perfectibility of this great republic. And so that's basically the reason. I mean, and plus it's kind of fun. I mean, we <laughs> Well, and, and, and you can contemplate, I suppose, about how our country would have gone in a completely different direction. Well, yeah, if we'd lost. I mean, if Lee had won, that'd have been a problem. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I mean, it'd have been yes, more of a would. problem for me than you. <laughs> <laughs> that's probably so. <laughs> Well, so let, let's <laughs> let's stick with reflections uh, reflections on, on the last twenty five yeah, years, well, not a hundred like and some odd years too ago. Much to have lost. Uh, <laughs> so, and, and perhaps you'll mention your maritime opinion. You know, so opinions that you've written over over the years. I mean, I remember the first time I read an opinion of yours that uh, that just. It just captured me. It was a 1999 opinion. It was, you know, it was a, morale, a, a city of Chicago versus Morales in which the court uh, struck down an anti-loitering, really an anti-gang uh, ordinance. And, and you wrote this passionate dissent about saying, you know, for the, the supposed right to loiter of the 2%, you were condemning 98% of the residents to have to be behind. And, and you know, it, that just hit me and has stuck with me. I'm, I'm curious. What opinions over the course of your, over the course of your career have, have stuck with you as, as having been ones you're most proud of or most profound? Mm, I don't know. I think there are ones that, there are different types of opinions. I don't, I, I don't really see them as trophies. I don't think about them when I'm done. Um, I think about, you know, there are opinions that I think about. They're usually ones that are really hard. 
you know, uh, the Bettis opinion. Really, I agonized over and then agonized throughout the summer on, on um, again, that was a, um, oh, she lost her car. The government took her car and her husband's car because he was visiting a prostitute. Right. That really bothered me a lot. Um, the, 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 the cases like the Haitian refugees, um, cases where your heart goes one way, but you've got to stick with the law. Those are really hard opinions, and I think those are the ones that you think a lot about. Mm -hmm. The ones where you, and those are the ones where your hair begins to fall out. The, um, but you know, the one you mentioned, Morales, the thing that concerned me was, I think sometimes we make, we write these opinions, uh, or the court decides cases, and the, that case, that was about keeping gangs off the street so that poor inner city people could walk down the street. Little kids could go to school. I lived in the inner city. And you imprison people if they're not capable of using, uh, whether it's public transportation or public streets. And I think sometimes we, uh, because we don't have a sense of that neighborhood, we don't really, all right, we don't point out that side of the equation. So that was just a paragraph or so of the opinion, but I was just making that point at the end after you went through the vagueness analysis, et cetera. But I don't really go back and, 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 and sort of look at specific opinions. I look at things that I need to do more work on. Um, I look at um, uh, opinions that, for example, if I have to, uh, you know, I taught a course on stare decisis and spent about a month or so preparing for that simply because people talk about it a lot and you don't have time during the term to read thousands of pages sure. on, on that. But the ones where I'm not sure is where I, I probably agonize over and spend more time, particularly during the, uh, during the summers. Yeah, so we'll get to start decisis a little, a little later. Do you spend more time agonizing over the opinions in which you're trying to command a majority or about the ones in which, say, you're alone dissenter, and, and, and how do you work that in terms of moderating your position if you do in order to try to bring more of your fellow justices along to join an opinion of yours? Well, you know, I think I don't really have a problem writing majority opinions. I mean, I, I rarely have problems with that. You are, you be, you're an agent for the majority when you're writing for the majority, and I don't try to. One of the things you learn in the court, at the court over time is that everybody knows everybody. And if you're honest, you're an honest broker when you're writing for the majority, you really don't have a problem. So I, I really have never had a problem with that. I mean, I, you know, any number of opinions that start out fractured, 5-4 or 4-4-1 four, four, or something like that, they wind up 8-1 or 7-2. So that's not a problem. Um, but you agonize over it if it's a technical opinion. You know, you take something like the... Um, uh, whether or not you can uh, patent the um, uh, the breast cancer gene, I mean, yeah, that's technical, so that's difficult. Um, but it's difficult in a different way from, say, the Haitian refugee case. Um, so you you spend you have, of course you have to spend a lot of time on it. Um, but you, I don't agonize over it. I said, oh my gosh, how did I get this one? But the um, the their tax opinions that that you might, might be complicated, but you don't lose a lot of emotional energy over a tax case. Um, well, but I was really curious, in, in, say in constitutional cases, when you're, you're trying to get some of your fellow justices to join your opinion and see things your way, I really how much will you moderate? I really spend a lot of time on that. Okay, well, that, that's, well, that's, well okay. So, so you're, you're going to express your view on what the, and whether others join you or not. Is, if is, we agreed, and I'm writing for the majority, yes. I write a little more narrowly, a little more uh, uh, crisply, to, to, because someone doesn't want to go quite as far. But you don't change the principle. Uh, you might, you, for example, you might compromise and not go as far to hold the court. You do that sometimes. But you don't change your underlying view or your underlying principle. I never do that. I haven't done that in 25 years. That doesn't mean that I, did the, I don't make a mistake, but I don't believe in doing that. Mm -hmm. So when you write separately, I try to be thoughtful. I mean, even I, if you go back and you take a look 
is when I wrote when uh, when I wrote separately in the McDonald case. I would love to have been in the majority there, but I still believe we should not ignore the privileges or immunities clause. And so we spent an enormous amount of time explaining the uh, history of the privilege or immunities clause and what it included. And I'm not saying that I had it perfectly or anything like that, but we did a ton of work on it. Uh, you don't just throw it out. We did it a, a, a few years ago. We did three, uh, three uh, opinions in, um, in the administrative law area, which I think is very important. And that was quite a haul because you were trying to show the implications of what we had been doing. And it took a lot of extra work, simply because I think you owe it to people that when you're breaking new ground, that you have to explain things more thoroughly and more in depth. Yeah, uh, but certainly with respect to McDonald, we can talk a little bit about more about privileges or immunities in a bit. And certainly with respect to the administrative law decisions, which you've been talking about, your, your bold positions with respect to the you know the vesting clauses, you've been been quite out front and quite bold, and I, you know, I applaud you for that. Well, one thing that I know that's on the mind of really everybody in here uh, is you know, still absorbing the impact of the passing of your good friend, Justice uh, Antonin Scalia, last February. And I'm just curious whether you could perhaps share some you know, fond reminiscences of your time with him, either on or off the court. You know, I did not know Justice Scalia before I got to the court. I had not met him. Uh, I had one law clerk, uh, my first law clerk, Chris Landau, who had clerked for him. And so he snuck me in his chambers when he wasn't in one time. And that was really the most extensive time I'd ever been uh, in, at the court before I was, uh, became a member of the court. But when I got to the court, Justice Scalia made it a point. You know, he has this reputation of being the sort of tough, sort of, uh, uh, I think unfairly uh, treated as, as being aggressive in some ways. I never found that side. We might disagree on something, but it was always very, very warm and very cordial. It's also enormously respectful. Um, from the first days I, I was there to, to the last days. Um, our relationship was not one, I mean, I didn't go to the Kennedy Center to watch it, to do, see operas with him. <laughs> and he's, I used to kid him about that. I said, Nino, I like opera. I just don't want to be around the people who like opera. <laughs> <And> I, <clears throat> the, <laughs> he always thought that was really funny. <laughs> and he always thought it was really odd that um, I was from the South but wouldn't go honey. And I thought it was really odd that he was from New York and New Jersey and he went honey. <laughs> Uh, the, um, but he would try to talk me into that, and I told him I just, there was no good come, no good comes from being in the woods. <laughs> and, uh, and, um, but he, we, it was absolutely delightful. I would go in his office, you know, and we would just literally most of the time was just laughing. Sometimes he'd be a little down, and I'd try to boost him up, boost him a little bit, and get him going, and. Um, one of the funny things toward the end was we were on opposite side. He was really pretty aggressive with that Fourth Amendment. And um, so we were on opposite sides again in a Fourth Amendment case. And I think it was um, an anonymous uh, tip about a drunk driver. And he, or it was, I forget which one. It might have been the DNA case. I can't remember which. But in his opinion, as a dissent, he said that. Um, this is a liberty, liberty, liberty destroying cocktail. <laughs> God, I said, that's a good line. <laughs> I said, Nino, so you think my opinion is a liberty destroying cocktail? Yeah. So <laughs> at the end of the term, we went to lunch. And it was the last lunch we went, we, we went to as a cha two chambers. It was really a tradition we started early on. And he was there, and he's ordering, and he's trying to figure out now, what, do I, what kind of a cocktail do I have before lunch? I said, Nino, how about a Liberty Destroying cocktail? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you thought that was hilarious. <laughs> so, but one of my favorites is uh, Nino, of course, was a constitutional law expert and loved, I mean, he loved talking. Like, and I think he must have thought I was just a wrecking ball or something, but... He loved constitutional, I mean, uh, administrative law, I'm sorry. Right. 
And <clears throat> so we were sitting on the bench one day, and I would only say this because he's, he is, you know, it's just really, but the, um, he leans over to me, he said, Clarence, our, A-U-E-R, our is one of the worst opinions in the history of this country. Yeah, Nino. Nino, yeah, you wrote it. <laughs> Which is he, oh my goodness, he couldn't remember what he had done. But, yeah, but, 30 years is 30 years. <laughs> but he, I trusted him, and we trusted each other. Even when we disagreed, I, uh, if I told him I didn't agree with him, he trusted that I didn't agree with him. If he was on the other side and he had an edit, he'd call me up and he had a concern. I trusted him. And the, I didn't have to look for where he was. I didn't have to talk to him. I, we almost never talked about cases before we voted. Mm. It was very rare. But we would almost invariably, for slightly different reasons, wind up on the same side. And we just, he always thought it was really hilarious. He said, how did you wind up in the same position? You're from down here. You know, you come from a barely literate family. His father was like a romance literature professor. And I said, it's just too good. I mean, for some reason, we wind, I'm from this, he was from the north, I was from the south, but we wound up at the same place. And, but it was just, I mean, it was, it, I can honestly tell you I miss him. Well, that was one and of the points just, I remember he made in his dissent, I guess, in, in uh, perhaps it was Obergefell, in which uh, he said, you know, that there's a lot, if we're going to make policy decisions between the court, that then regional variation, all that stuff really yeah. matters. But of course, if you're going about the task of actually being a judge and interpreting the law in a, in a you know, in a consistent uh, way that that sort of regional variation shouldn't really matter. You know, he tried very, very hard, in my opinion, to always be open to disagreements, uh, concerns. Um, he always cared about the big things, the principles, the small things like syntax and vocabulary and punctuation. Um, he would, I would go by to see him, and he's got a rack of books there, and he um, is booking his opinions, you know, he's going through them. He did the small, he did the big, and he cared about it all, so, and that teaches you a lesson, uh -huh. that it all matters. So the, the you know, I, after he'd passed away, <clears throat> the course of it is horrible, it was just horrible in every way. I was, um, and normally left the bench right after him, and he was, we, his office, his chambers were next to mine, so I would walk, be a few steps behind him because I left uh, later. And we would, I would catch up to him and we'd talk a bit, usually just sort of about nothing, yucking it up. And the first day he was gone, I caught myself coming off the bench, taking a quick step to try to catch him. Mm. And sort of, that sort of was the poignant example of someone who's missing, mm. um, that he's not there. I mean, there's nobody to catch up to. But um, he was, a, for me, a fun guy. I mean, the, 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 I would often just go in and it was not about cases. It was just to talk. And sometimes if, I, if one of his clerks told me he was down a little bit, I would go in and we'd laugh. And then you leave and hopefully he felt a little better. You know? Well, obviously, your respect was, uh and admiration for each other was quite mutual. Well, in light of this current vacancy, you know, one of these days we're going to have another confirmation mm -hmm. hearing. And there are, are a lot of people uh, who, of course, believe that the confirmation process is broken, uh, your confirmation being one example uh, of that. And I'm, I'm curious your thoughts on whether there's any hope to improve the confirmation process. You know, there's always hope. Um, <laughs> but uh, this city is broken in some ways. Um, the, you know, I've been here now most of my adult, most of my life now, and the, um, I think that we have become very comfortable with not thinking things through and um, debating things. That's one of the things I love about the court. You can actually talk to people about things. Um, and I think that we have decided that rather than confront the disagreements and the differences of opinion, 
will just simply annihilate the person who disagrees with me. Mm. Um, I don't think that's going to work. I don't think that's going to work in a republic or in a, a civil society. Um, the, and at some point, we have got to recognize that we're destroying our institutions and we're undermining our institutions. And the, we're going to destroy them, but the day's going to come if it's not already here when we need the institutions mm. and the integrity of the institutions. So even when you disagree with people, uh, if you notice in my opinions, I, I, I don't attack personally my, my colleagues. I, I disagree with them strongly because I think it's important for me to leave them standing and to leave the institution standing and to sharply dis have the uh, contrast and the, the points of view. Mm. But I don't think that's going to change in the city until we get back to sort of the notion that we argue, that we debate, that we decide things based on logic and facts and reason as opposed to uh, who yells the loudest or who has the best narrative or best meme or some other nonsense. So. Well, let me, let me build on that a little bit. So obviously there are a lot of people in this country who believe that you know, the, the, the presidency uh, and Congress is you know, sort of irretrievably broken. They've just lost confidence mm. in those institutions. There are a lot of people that have lost confidence in the courts, including your court, and really sort of view it as just being just another political branch. Mm -hmm. What do you say to people who believe that? You know, I'd probably say more to us. What have we done to gain their confidence? And I don't think people owe us reflexively confidence. Uh, I think it's something we earn. And that you try to do your job in a way uh, that they can have confidence in what you do. You try to do the hard things that they, don't, they shouldn't be doing in a way that they can have confidence in, that you can trust. And perhaps we should ask ourselves why, what we have done to not earn it or to earn it. Mm. And I'm not so sure I have all the answers to that. But one of the things I tell my clerks, I just simply, uh, you simply try to live up to the oath you took. You took an oath to show fidelity to the Constitution, you live up to it. You took an oath to judge people impartially, you live up to it. Uh, yeah, that's in this city. That doesn't go f for much. Uh, the, you take heat for it or whatever, but that's part of the job. You're supposed to be beaten for it. You're supposed to do your job. And so hopefully someone that will run up to you one day with your Federal Maritime Commission opinion <laughs> <laughs> and have a lot of confidence. And he's shaking it. This is what this is all about. So. And that doesn't sound like a whole lot. Nobody cares. I mean, probably most people don't even care about it. But it does mean something to you when an average citizen has confidence that you did your job fairly. You did it right, as best you could. And didn't, he didn't say he agreed with me. Right. He said he could understand it. And he accepted it because of that. Well, certainly you and, and Justice Scalia and some of your colleagues, when you think the court has issued a political opinion, or we'll, we'll call them out for that. Do you think that there's a hope of sort of reining that in? Do you hope that perhaps your colleagues over time will be persuaded? Or what do you hope to gain by putting that out? Oh, I don't know. I mean, I, th I think that, you know, if, you, if you're going to do substantive due process, you, you run the risk of, of broad policy decisions. Uh, you, you tend to stray uh, far afield from law. And what Justice Scalia was saying is that you've got to have rules. You've got to, it's got to be, it, it's got to do some work. You know, I, you wouldn't, nobody's really that interested in it. But that's part of the reasons I, I dissented in the commercial speech cases, you know, in the Central Hudson test. You know, it's a multi-factor, four-factor test that always takes you where you want to go. Right. You know, well, that's not much of a test. Right. And the, um, but my the, I think that Justice Scalia understood, whether it was the Lemon test or even the Central Hudson test, that we have got to have something with more teeth to it, with more grip to it, than, than, than that sort of a test. And that's the problem with substantive due process. And these leave rooms for you to come out where you want to go as a policy preference. And I think so. I don't know whether it's totally people are political in the sense of the politics of the city, but the jurisprudence allows for it. 
it allows for that criticism. I mean, we took criticism in, let's say, in Bush v. Gore or something like that. People can easily throw out and cast aspersions about a particular opinion here or there. But I think what you try to do is you do your job in a way where you know that you have uh, applied the law in a fair way. You know, some years ago, a court that I really enjoyed being on was the one that was when the, the composition that was together for over 11 years with Justice Souter and O'Connor and, and Stevens. Uh, we were together a long time. And one of the things that one of my colleagues with whom I rarely agreed said, that said, Clarence, you are consistent. And I think that that is, whether you're it's baseball or a, a referee in basketball, you want, call it the same way. Just call it the same way for both sides, and you can live with that. Now, like the maritime guy, he wasn't necessarily paying you a compliment when he said that yeah, either. But he could understand. He may not have agreed with yeah. you, but he appreciated but what he you were doing. But he never said he agreed. Right. No, 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 I get it. Well, so I, I want to talk a little bit about certain provisions you've just made reference yeah. to substantive due process. Before I do that, I, I, I want to take a, a slightly broader view. You, you said that the Constitution is not a standalone document, and that it can really only be properly understood uh, in combination with the Declaration of Independence. And I wonder whether you could elaborate on that a little bit. You know, my point was that we, had a, we have to understand why this. This was a question I was trying to answer in the mid-1980s. Why this government? Why this republic? Why isn't it something else? Why didn't we do what the French did? You know, the, and so I had to start with the Declaration. You know, the government by consent, inalienable rights, et cetera. And what were we protecting? with the structure in our Constitution. And I think you, when you look at the Constitution, which is the positive document, in, in a, with a declaration as a, as a backdrop, you understand why this republic, why is separation of powers so important? Why is federalism so important? Why are uh, enumerated powers so important? Why a written Constitution? Why is it so important? Because they're, they're certain you gave up only you gave up some of your rights in order to be governed, not all of them. And the it's that limitation, the protection of that liberty. You know, I went back. I read a lot of Justice Scalia's separation of powers opinions <coughs> this summer, and um, they all seem to come back to one theme: protecting individual liberty. It wasn't just to have separation of powers. It wasn't just to have federalism. It wasn't just to have enumerated powers. It was in order, you had these in order to protect liberty. But where does that start? It starts in the Declaration. Yeah, so people, I always find it frustrating that people will talk about the Bill of Rights as if that's the cake as opposed to, you know, these were 10 amendments to mm. the actual document that was our, our charter of freedom, you know, that we, the people, were going to consent to be governed uh, by this. And, and, you know, they ignore that, 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 is, that those structural protections are what really gave us liberty. You know, it's really interesting. I did not fully understand that until, again, sitting at EEOC in the 1980s with Ken and John Marini, Ken Masugi and John Marini. On the, I certainly didn't get it from law school because <laughs> the amendments were a big deal in law school and we didn't even read the Constitution in full. But I think the structure is so important and perhaps that's where on the constitutional issues, uh, perhaps that's where Justice Scalia and I saw eye to eye from the very beginning, the, the critical importance of the structure. The other thing was that the text, this is a written constitution. This isn't common law. This isn't like we will make it up as we go along with common law where you have to have the uh, uh, stare decisis has to lock it down. You have a written document. You have written amendments, which are really important because it's, a, it, you know, again, a, a positive document. So I, I think that the, uh, the structure is important, more, the most important part of it. Uh, the limitations built into that structure are critically important. And we tend to, that's why you see, for example, that I would write extensively on the Commerce Clause. You know, look what you're doing. You're eviscerating the relationship, uh, the, the, what the national government can do. This is an enumerated power. 
And if you expand that, if you go from regulating commerce to uh, if, uh, effects, economic effects, or com effects on commerce or whatever, that's a t quite different test from regulating commerce. Well, I, I, you just touched on sort of revisiting uh, past precedent, stare decisis. I'll get to that in a moment. I want to lead, though. So you've talked a little bit about privileges or immunities. You've made some statements about substantive due process. So when you look at different clauses in terms of protecting personal liberties, economic liberties, uh, what you know, which clauses do you sort of gravitate to? Due process clause, the equal protection clause, the privileges or immunities clause, or, or what other provisions? Whatever's in the Constitution. I mean, I, it's all there. The Bill of Attainers there. The, on, on, on the Third Amendment's there that we skip over. The Second Amendment, we want to pretend doesn't exist. Um, the First Amendment has, you know, Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion. What is the establishment of religion? You know, it's not, it doesn't say it doesn't have like wall of separation, right. it has establishment of religion. So you go back to the language, what does it mean? And we're obligated to do that. We're absolutely obligated. Or people's theories. I think Judge Brown gave a, a lecture on that about these theories. These theories can spin off in a totally different direction from the limitations built into the Constitution itself. And I think that's quite important. All right. So that's great. So you, you talked about uh, you know, limited uh, enumerated powers for government, the structural protections. You've mentioned uh, how the privileges or immunities clause has been perhaps ignored, even though it's right there. So let's talk about your view of, of stare decisis. So you have been both praised and criticized, depending on which side of the aisle you happen that's to be good. on, for, for, <laughs> for being perhaps more willing than some of your colleagues to revisit past precedent, and this isn't unique. I mean, sometimes the court has, whenever it's deemed it appropriate over the course of its history, revisited preferences in some, you know, precedent in some way. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm curious to sort of hear your views on, on stare decisis, on these constitutional uh, questions, and you know, how, how would you respond to your critics about this? I don't, I don't really care. Okay, <laughs> that's that is like the last part of that. <laughs> I mean, I just, stare decisis I care about, the criticism I don't. Um, the, so that's why I taught the summer. I mean, I read everything I could get my hands on on stare decisis. And the theory is all over the place. I mean, Goldberg, uh, Justice Goldberg's theory was basically, if, you know, the, as you, it's a ratchet. You know, as you improve civil liberties, you, those strict rules of stare decisis apply when you, when you, when you win those cases. But when they need to overrule cases in order to do what he thinks is the right thing, then a loose set rules of stare decisis apply. Then you get Brandeis. He has his rules on stare decisis. But he overrules Swift v. Tyson, which was a 96-year-old precedent. You know? Then what do you do with Plessy versus Fr What do you do with Plessy? You know? when, and when you get Brown. So you've got lots of precedents out there that have been changed. Or what do you, you have Justice Brennan redoing uh, the the, the uh, political question doctrine sure. in Baker v. Carr. I'm not saying he overruled anything, but boy, it didn't look like it used to look. <laughs> and the, um, but the, the point is that they change a lot of things, and when people get what they want, then they start yelling starry decisis, <laughs> as though that is, a, that is supposed to stop you. That's like boogeyman or something. <laughs> I think that the Constitution itself, the written document, is the ultimate. Uh, uh, stare decisis, that it is written. So, so <clears throat> if it, the, uh, the, the, Caleb Nelson has, I think, a nice piece. I'm not saying it's totally right, but Caleb's very thoughtful on stare decisis, and he makes a point. It, you know, if you have a, a choice between two, if the statute allows you to choose between A and B, and the, the, you would, on a clean slate, choose B, but the court's already choose, chosen A, that you give that stare decisis. Because the choices were there, the court's chosen, you don't change it. But if the court has chosen C, when the statute gave you A and B, right. then that is clearly erroneous. Everybody thinks that that does not uh, de uh, deserve stare decisis of A. But now let's just apply it to something else. Let's do substantive due process now. You get people saying constantly, I think, that what we have done, that, that, that um, let's say, 
the slaughterhouse case on, on, on privilege on immunity clause. Slaughterhouse case is wrongly decided. Well, my point at McDonald wasn't I had the answer. I didn't say that. I said if everybody agrees it's wrongly decided, then why are we applying it? <laughs> That's it. As simple as that. And you, I think you, we, get, we have to do more than like just zip up. We have to just say, you know, we're not applying it for these reasons. Well, stare decisis, it leaves you, leaves, it, it, it leaves you wanting an explanation. Right, right. So that's, so I'm, I'm not, I wasn't trying to grandstand or anything, <laughs> and that goes back to my FMC guy, that we owe him an explanation. Even if you come out the other way, you owe him an explanation. We all agree slaughterhouse is wrongly decided. It has had a profound effect on this country. And you know it and I know it. That when you guarantee uh, the citizenship to people, the privileges or immunities of citizenship that cannot be impinged upon, and then you read it out of the Constitution, or you trivialize it, or you minimize it. If I said, said to you, okay, I said, John, you're a member of my club. You have all the privileges or immunities of this of membership in this club. Then I rewrite the, the, the privileges or immunities to mean you get to ride the elevator once a week, and that's it. <laughs> you said, boy, that's a heck of a membership. <laughs> Everybody else is swimming, and they're in the gym, et cetera. They're in the sauna, and I just get to ride the elevator once. That's the way I feel about the privileges or immunities clause. And as I said to you about the battle at Gettysburg, I have a personal interest in this. And I've always thought, I mean, slaughter, I lived under segregation. And we, we talk about all around these things. This is at the very heart of it. Go back to Dred Scott. Here you have Tawny. What did he say? That no black could be a citizen right, for the purpose of diversity jurisdiction. And he goes on and on and on about the other stuff, you know, the Kansas, Nebraska Act, et cetera. Now, the 13th, 14th, particularly the 14th Amendment, answered his question. It guaranteed that citizenship and all the privileges and immunities of citizenship. And then we sit here and we read it out of the Constitution. So anyway, that's, I get, you know, you said, why do you get passionate about it? It is the heart and soul. It's not just a subject. It's not just a theory. It is what makes it all work. It was a way to perfect a big blemish on this, on this country's history. That is the blemish of slavery. It was the big contradiction, and we fought a war over it. You know, so you, you it's interesting your approach to stare decisis. So it really is sort of once you get what you want, it's a one-way ratchet. You get what you want, and then all of a sudden it becomes settled law, which uh, ought not to be uh, revisited. And, you know, it's if I were on the Court of Appeals or the District Court, then I have to apply the precedent. And I did that when I was for the two minutes I was on the DC circuit. <laughs> and I would do that. I would faithfully do that. But we are in a different place. And I believe we are obligated to think things through constantly, mm. to re-examine ourselves, to go back over turf we've already plowed, to think it through, to, to like torment yourself to make sure you're right. You made reference before to the fact that you used to have four cases that you would hear a day. So I mean, the court used to hear 140, 150 cases. Now you hear about 70. How did this come to be? And is this a, a positive development or a negative development? What are your thoughts about that? Oh, I guess it's, well, if you think they're rightly decided, it's a positive development. <laughs> or actually, if you think that we have been wrongly deciding cases, it's a positive development. You know, I don't know. I, everyone comes to the court thinking that there are more cases to grant cert in. And then we wind up doing exactly what we were doing before. When I got to the court, it was close to 120 cases or so. And that was a lot. And the court had been doing 150 or so at some point. Uh, I think around 110 or so would be good, 100 to 110. Um, but I don't see any prospects with our uh, I don't see any prospects with our uh, discretionary jurisdiction mm. that that's going to happen anytime soon. Also, take this into consideration. Other than the health care, the Affordable Care Act, which seems like a kind of a misnomer considering all the things that are going on, <laughs> the, the Affordable Care Act is, was one of the last pieces of major legislation. 
one of the few pieces of major legislation. So it's not like you have a lot of that, where the real action is, uh, was uh, the activity legislative the occurs is actually in the agencies, right. in the administrative agencies. So I don't know if there's that much legislation that's actually going on that requires review. Uh, when I first got to the court, we still had the new bankruptcy code, and we had quite a few of those cases. Um, at one point, we got a new uh, on EDPA, was uh, in the criminal area, so we had a ton of litigation there. And what we're doing with the, in the area of criminal law and the collateral review, which is a God only knows what. But the, I think you're going to get a lot of review in the lower courts on that. But there's not been major legislation. And uh, so I can't, I don't know what the source of the litigation would be. The other thing is that a lot of the, and I don't know the, the, the total impact of this, but a lot of the cases are being siphoned off or it being uh, diverted to uh, mediation or arbitration. And we have a very light review of that under the Federal Arbitration Act. So they're not coming up like just the, the normal commercial litigation through the, through the federal court system. Right. They're like off to the side. And I think that may be a cost consideration for the companies that are engaged in this. You know, so you were mentioning uh, before that about there's very little legislation, and regardless of whether you happen to like the Affordable Care Act or don't like the Affordable Care well, Act, I, and I think it's bad. I know, yeah, no, I understand I that. It was... Certainly bad for the country that that was done on you know such a one-sided basis. Remember, John basis. said no, that. I didn't yeah, say no, 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 no. I, I, yeah. I totally get that. <laughs> but 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 one interesting point is that obviously that legislation and many other bills that that pass when they pass do exactly what you just said, which is they said, here's, you know, I'm going to empower some agency to go out and do, do good, basically. They need some nebulous direction. Mm -hmm. And the agencies are often effectively uh, performing, or um, I'll ask you, legislative uh, function, then they're executing those, they're performing an executive yeah. function, they then often act as tribunals, so they're performing a judicial function. You know, how do you approach those sorts of cases when you're trying to interpret law and figure out uh, you know, where the line is. You made reference to Justice Scalia's uh, statement about our, uh, you know, how do you approach those cases sort of differently when you're thinking about taking them up and deciding? You know, I, I do my job. I don't, to be honest with you, I think if a case is cert worthy, you take it. That if there's a split, there's a big issue, it's preserved, you take the case. I don't get into, you know, we may not win this or anything. That's not my job. My job is to decide cases, cases of controversies. Um, the administrative law area is obviously complicated, but it's our job. And it's complicated by things like Chevron. It's complicated by our willingness to say, oh, let the expert agency decide, and then give them all this running room. More running room, by the way, than we would give an Article Three judge. Oh, right. So. I think it is, and you, you know that I've written extensively in these areas, and it isn't because I had any ax to grind. I did not have an ax to grind. But I do think that we, when we don't review things, we abdicate our responsibilities. Uh, we are required, there are checks and balances in our system. A part of the, the check, in, from the judicial standpoint, is the review uh, uh, the cases. You don't review cases when you say, oh, we defer to uh, virtually anything the agency does. That's not a review. Mm -hmm. We don't do that to a district judge. Um, and district judges are Article Three judges. They have the same status that, and, and courts of appeals have the exact same status we have. But we do that to, every, to the agencies. So I think we are, and I've written again on this, I think that as a, just a constitutional matter, we are obligated to, to be more exacting in our review. That doesn't mean you don't show them some deference, but I think we're obligated to do more than just wave uh, uh, our hands at it and say, well, Chevron and be done with it. Mm. That's no review at all. How helpful do you find amicus briefs? Which ones? Well, I, <laughs> I, I'll leave it to you. So do you. Do you read all the amicus briefs in all the cases? How do you sort no. of go about picking? <laughs> Well, how do you, you know, so this particular party? I mean, if, if you got, if you have 30 amicus. Yeah, no, it's huge. Yeah. There are people who are credible. The ACLU, for example, is credible. You find people that you may not agree with what they say, but they're good. So that's a good brief you should read. The U.S. government, that's a, you, you read that. 
Uh, you read the briefs of states, if it's uh, something that they say 10 states are writing. Some. But some people, you know, like law professors for a better world. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that one doesn't just sort of run, that's sort of like one-off kind of group. I, I mean, you might go through it, right. but they, they start out with some polemic or something like there was one. There was an excellent amicus brief we had by electrical engineers supporting neither party. <laughs> and it had to do with a grid. They were explaining an electrical grid. And I just thought it was just excellent because I didn't know what the heck a grid was, and neither party was explaining it. And these, but so these engineers actually helped the court. They were friends of the court. Every, you run across these in technical cases, too. Somebody, it might be uh, it, uh, uh, the uh, sort of um, intellectual property group might explain, say, a technical patent area. And or a, a, a and then that is a good brief. That's a good, thank you. Thank yeah, but there, there, there are. <laughs> I think my, for me, a brief if it is thorough, if it is honest, if they, if you can look at that and said this is an honest broker, that this person you don't agree with that position, but this is honest. This is an honest brief. Then you re you, for the repeat people, you read it again. So, or the if it's if they make a point, a good point. You will read their next brief, but if it's somebody just, just sort of a one-off, I mean, you don't spend a lot of time with those. Mm. We're nearing Unless the end it's of our a party. We're, so we're nearing the well. I assume you read those briefs. We're nearing, <laughs> we're nearing the end of our time. I want to step back. So you know, you you and and Ginny, I gather, go during the summers, and you know, you you, you head off on a bus and you travel the country. I'm, I'm, Two days I spent on my bus. Now it's a shame. Yeah, you got to work it better disciples. this uh, work it better this summer, but. Um, Tell, tell us a little bit about that experience, some of the great experiences you've had, why you do that, and you know, how does that help revive you? This, first of all, is a wonderful country, and we fly over most of it. We fly from destination to destination. Um, I had never been to East Tennessee. I grew up in Georgia, and the, the thing about segregation, and we have it going on with things like uh, political correctness and all sorts of things in our society now, it's, it created fear that you couldn't talk to each other, you couldn't go any place. Um, so the fear in Georgia was I couldn't go to small towns. I got to do that with my mother now. And I wanted to see small towns, to see the con our country. And now that I can do that without fear, um, we thought that we would do it. I, poor, my poor wife sort of, she, she let me do it. And she, <laughs> she came along and that's, we both love it now. And we've, we've been doing, we've got the same bus we've had for 17 years. And we, this is East Tennessee. Have you ever been to Katie's Cove, for example? Mm -hmm. Or have you ever been to Sevierville and, and Dolly's, what was it done? Dolly World. Dolly World, yeah. What did we go see with the horses? <laughs> yeah, it was, um, but anyway, we've been to a lot of different things. Then we go, we've been out to the west. We like the mountains. We get down to Florida. Um, but most of all, you see the citizens of this country. It is a, an RV park is very, very uh, democratic with a small D. It is some of everybody there. The people are camping out of the back of a motorcycle, which is really interesting to see. Um, the people, the first time we went, we have a 40-foot coach, and we were next to this little teardrop thing that was about the size of this thing and this table, and we said, this is really embarrassing. And, um, but it's just, there's everybody there. The truck stop, Flying J, pilot, I run into people. So it was right after Bush v. Gore. You asked me. This is yeah. about to, I love this stuff. I love the bus. I love the diesel stuff. I love the people, the truckers, everybody. I love it all. So I give you just two stories. So Bush v. Gore, which was, whether you know it or not, was a bit controversial, right? <laughs> so I'm told. <laughs> oh, boy, you were talking about feeling the heat around here. So <laughs> I had to take my bus down to Florida the week after Bush v. Gore. 
<laughs> so I, I certainly took security with me that time. <laughs> and so I stopped in Brunswick, Georgia. I shot south of Brunswick, Georgia to refuel at the Flying J. And so I'm like, it's not like a car, you know, right. it's a real professional thing when you do a bus. You gotta put your fueling gloves on and look around like you know what the heck you're doing. <laughs> and so these, all these 18 wheelers are around, you know, and I'm like, look, pretending. And this trucker comes up to me and he says, uh, I'm standing at it, he says, anybody ever tell you you look like Clarence Thomas? <laughs> 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 and so I said to him, yeah. <laughs> and he said, I bet it happens all the time, doesn't it? <laughs> and then he went on about his business. <laughs> so then we were recently on the road. So all these things happen to you on the road. Oh, God, it's great. Even the breakdowns are great. So we were in Pennsylvania, and my, the bus, this is a bad thing. You're going up these mountains, endless mountain, that was it. Well, the bus speed was ending. <laughs> so you get up to the top, the bus was dying. So finally, we pulled into a truck stop, into a Flying J in, uh, in Pennsylvania, after we got out of New York. And we look around, there's these two guys, you know, on this little mobile van repairing with a half a set of teeth between them. And <laughs> but they, they knew how to fix diesel motors, and we were back on the road. That's the kind of thing. And these guys were great. They were great to talk to. I mean, you had to try to figure out some things. <laughs> <laughs> but it was absolutely wonderful. Everything about it, I love it. I just, it is, this is a great country. We've done about 40 states and um, talks, met a lot of people, been a lot of places. And I, it's one of the, it's freedom for me. And I assume most of the people don't know who you are. So that most people don't care. Okay. Well, that's <laughs> I mean, we, very I think, refreshing, I would think, for yeah, you. For me, it is. Yeah. I mean, it's just, and it also tells you that it shows you the constituency for the Constitution. Mm -hmm. It shows you it's not the city. It's not the people who are doing all the talking and all the prevaricating. It's just a person camping out of the back of his motorcycle who wants to be left alone, right. who wants to enjoy his country, wants to raise his family or her family. And they're just friendly. If you go to an RV park, People wave, they come by. They're, sometimes they're too friendly. You just want to sit there and they want to come and <laughs> chit chat. And they don't know you from a hill of beans, but they're just friendly. So I think that it has shown me a part of the country that you wouldn't normally see. I would not have seen in Georgia, and I would not see from Washington, D.C., which are two very different perches, but both in their own way limited perches. Right. Well, in a moment, I'm going to bring uh, Ed Meese back uh, up here for a special presentation. And then I would actually ask afterwards if the people here in the audience would remain seated for a few moments while Justice Thomas uh, leaves. But I, I do have to ask you one more question, mm -hmm. which is um, any chance for a national title for the Nebraska Cornhuskers this year? Hey. They're seventh. They're seventh in the country. Look, we will be undefeated until we're robbed. <laughs> 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 Perfect answer. <laughs> well, I think we all would agree that we've been treated to a great evening here with Justice Thomas. Justice Thomas, if you would join me here, we have something to present to you first, and that is, this is our Defender of the Constitution Award. We only give one a year, and we don't do it every year unless we have a real defender. <laughs> but it says, the Honorable Clarence Thomas, Defender of the Constitution Award, the Heritage Foundation, 2016. Congratulations. What I'm about to do ought to be called the Coles to Newcastle Award because I'm giving you a set of the commentaries on the Constitution written by Joseph Story, Thank you, which 
you can add to probably the set you already have it in your office. This, this is for your home. <laughs> or, or even better, for the, for the bus. Do you mind if I share it with my colleagues? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. <laughs> well, I think this might be a better one for the colleagues because it's a short version. <laughs> but it's the it's the, called the familiar exposition of the Constitution of the United States by Joseph Story, and I have a particular interest in this because I was privileged to write the yeah, foreword. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Brad. Thank you.